attention was a very nice thing. These and other shows from your PBS station are available with Passport on the PBS Video app. Download it today. The 2022 Frederick Speaker Series presents author and social observer Fran Lebowitz, filmmaker and cultural critic Henry Louis Gates Jr., journalist and anchor Chris Wallace, then journalist and entrepreneur Soledad O'Brien. Details at WeinbergCenter.org. Since 2014, the Maryland Energy Administration Solar Canopy Grant has added over 20,000 kilowatts of solar generation to the state, which is enough energy to power over 2,100 Maryland homes. Learn more at energy.maryland.gov. Delmarva Public Media is a cooperative of three radio stations, WSCL Classical Delmarva, WSDL Rhythm and News, and WESM Jazz Blues and NPR News. Stream online at delmarvapublicmedia.org. University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Leading the way on Chesapeake Bay restoration while guiding our state, nation, and world toward a more sustainable future. State Circle is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Connecting Marylanders to their government. This is State Circle. Good evening and welcome to State Circle. This week, our annual preview of the legislative session. We'll hear from the presiding officers and a special look back as this program celebrates a major anniversary. But first tonight, Governor Hogan has ordered a renewed state of emergency in the face of a renewed global assault by COVID-19. The order gives the state additional powers to deal with an anticipated 5,000 hospital patients, which would be more than double the previous record. The governor made his first appearance since himself catching COVID and isolating in the governor's mansion. For me, it was uh, it was like a pretty bad cold, uh, and that's because I was fully vaccinated and and uh, boosted. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for that, so I didn't end up in the hospital or dead like so many other folks have in Maryland. Uh, I was able to get a monoclonal uh, anti antibody treatment early on in my uh, uh, you know, illness, and um, you know, very, very happy I had the chance to do that. To sign up for a vaccine or booster shot, visit covidvax.maryland.gov. Now to the 2022 session of the General Assembly, which begins next Wednesday. What new laws can Marylanders expect, and how will legislators function with COVID spreading so quickly? We spoke first with Senate President Bill Ferguson. So as the COVID experience has been throughout this entire uh, experience, uh, you know, it is dynamic. Um, and you know, my hope was that we would be able to be fully operational up in person. Um, you know, I do think that right now where we are is different than where we were even January 2021, March 2020. We are at a different place now. Um, certainly the, the hospitalizations and the, the concern of those who are particularly those who are unvaccinated um, is a very real issue uh, that is that is really hurting our healthcare system in a very real way. Um, but now with the new state of emergency in place, I think we're going to have to alter uh, just a bit. Um, we will still be, the senators and members will be in, per, in person, uh, but we may have to make some adjustments um, to recognize the, the community spread of COVID uh, to hearings and do a little bit more virtual, at least right now. And, and it's uh, up for debate how, how big a, a, a trade-off that is. The, the, the virtual hearings were kind of popular. Yeah, it's, it's back and forth. You know, I think that um, I certainly have a preference to be in person. I think the legislature is at its best um, when we are kind of sitting around a table trying to work through complex issues. Um, there are definitely benefits to a more uh, virtual environment, um, but it's always a balance. And as is the case in, in most things, um, trying to, to balance safety and transparency and access. Um, you know, we were able to get through safely last year. I'm, I'm confident that we will again this year. All right, let's get to a couple of those complex issues. Your, your background is in education, so I wanted to ask you about what's happening in schools as they're having to go back to virtual at, at some points. Through the course of the pandemic, it, it's been tough on, on everybody, teachers and kids. We interviewed a school superintendent from Southern Maryland a couple of weeks ago, said 90% of the kids there are behind where they should be because of the pandemic. Is there anything 
the legislature can do this session to help them catch up? Uh, look, I think that the impact of COVID on young students has been um, absolutely devastating. Uh, and I think it's not just on academic performance, which obviously matters, but it's on the social, emotional, uh, sort of sense of well-being, sense of stability. That is the, the long tail of COVID is this um, uncertainty for, for, for children. It's why I believe our single most important priority for all of the adults is to do whatever we can to keep kids in school, to provide some level of stability. I absolutely understand the, the, the fear and trepidation and the concern that a number of teachers and educators have, but now we have got to find ways to stabilize this for kids. Kids can't keep bearing the cost uh, of unvaccinated adults. Um, it's just, it's, it's not okay. And so, um, you know, we have to keep continuing to push to make sure that they get vaccinated. Uh, what we can do is recognize that, that children are going to need a lot of supports for a while. We fortunately passed the blueprint for Maryland's future that is putting additional resources into schools. Um, we have to be ready to put the resources behind the social emotional wellness uh, to help kids feel stable again. Your legislative district is Baltimore City, which just saw its uh, seventh straight year of over 300 homicides, just had a police officer ambushed, uh, shot and killed in uh, the Curtis Bay area. What can be done? The governor has been pressing for uh, tougher gun laws. The, both houses of the legislature haven't agreed on that in the, in the past. What do you see happening in this session? Look, community safety is a fundamental priority. It will be a top priority and concern for us this legislative session. Uh, you know, from the beginning, I've said if there is a single law that we could pass uh, that would make a massive difference, we would have passed it years ago. Um, a lot of the laws that we've been talking about are things that are kind of tinkering around the edges. Uh, we know what actually impacts crime um, and what reduces crime and enhances safety. It is a clear, coordinated plan between all levels of government and all branches of government to reduce violence and expand access to opportunity and reduce poverty. That, that plan has to be coordinated, it has to be clear, and it has to be executed upon every single day consistently. Uh, you know, we have offered lots of ideas uh, and we've put forward a number of different initiatives. Uh, we will continue to put the resources behind uh, to ensure that our law enforcement officers have the resources that they need. We will continue to invest in programs that expand opportunity. But what is essential is government must have a coordinated plan at all levels, state, local, federal, and that it is being executed collaboratively every day. Um, until that happens, we're gonna keep seeing these spinoff impacts. Uh, and so, you know, we will continue to be ready. We'll make the, the marginal enhancements and changes in the law that we can, uh, but this is an executive function to create safety in communities. Um, and, and it has to happen today because where we are isn't, isn't acceptable. One of the things the, the legislature has to look at this year following the, the census is legislative redistricting, drawing uh, districts for senators and delegates. Baltimore City is going to lose representation uh, as a function of having lost population over the years. How is that map going to look from the standpoint of, of the city and the state? You know, it, it'll be a fair and transparent process. We've had a number of uh, meetings across the state uh, where we've heard viewpoints from Marylanders from Western Maryland to the Eastern Shore. Uh, we've had conversations with uh, with members and with uh, community members, with advocacy groups. Um, you know, we hope to have a map uh, ready from the Legislative Redistricting Advisory Commission moving forward uh, and will be introduced next week, hopefully on the first day of session. Uh, we'll have public hearings about that map. Um, you know, I don't think we'll see substantial changes other than reflections of changes in the, in the population overall in Maryland, um, but it'll be a fair and transparent map uh, that, uh, that Marylanders can be proud of. Your other uh, top issues heading into this session and, and the top concerns for the, uh, the Democratic caucus in the Senate. You know, I think first and foremost, uh, the COVID crisis and its, its multi-layer impact uh, both economic and health are, are going to drive this session again. Um, you know, I, I, I wish that we could say that we are on the other side of it, um, but we are, we are now facing kind of a, a new challenge uh, on the health side and, and ensuring that our healthcare professionals and hospital systems have what they need to get us through this. We will get through this wave as we have gotten through the others. 
Um, and we are going to have to continue to be nimble in putting resources on the other economic impacts of it, the supply chain issues, the workforce issues, the, the threats to the social safety net. Um, you know, one of the things that have, I've been very concerned about are the, the cases of child abuse that we've seen emerge over the last few months uh, as things started to reopen. I think that it, there was a lot of underreporting happening, and that's, that's a sign that our social, social safety net has been under a great deal of strain. Uh, and so, you know, we need to protect the most vulnerable uh, amongst us and make sure that vaccines continue to be out there. So, you know, COVID will drive and it'll be the, the myriad of COVID impacts, not just health, but also the economic impacts that Maryland, or Maryland families face every day. Um, so that's, that, that will be our, our, our major focus. And then of course, um, ensuring community safety. There's nothing more important for government than ensuring that people feel safe. State has a gigantic uh, fiscal surplus. Save it or spend it? Be really thoughtful about it. Um, you know, I think this is, it's an amazing, extraordinary reality that in the midst of a once in a hundred year moment, we have a significant budget surplus, but we have to be smart. Um, we cannot squander it. We can't uh, put ourselves in a position where we face a fiscal cliff in a few years. We have to be really, really thoughtful. Our thanks to Senate President Ferguson. Now our conversation with Speaker of the House, Adrian Jones. Madam Speaker, thank you so much for joining us. Happy New Year. Happy New Session. Let me ask you, what's the, the top of your agenda for this session? Thank you, and thank you for inviting me, and Happy New Year to you. Um, this session will focus on getting more people back to work, strengthening Maryland's families, and ensuring everyone can put food on the table and afford basic necessities. Obviously, we're going to be following COVID protocols when we come back to session on January 12th. Um, we've been following developments of Omicron very closely. Uh, a majority of our members and staff have been vaccinated and, and boosted. Um, so we're going to proceed with the uh, abundance of, of caution. We will have our committee hearings will be virtual and floor proceedings will be live streamed and we'll be going to pro forma session to be able to get the work out. So, so it doesn't require every member to be every day. Um, one thing I've learned about this pandemic that is constantly changing and we're learning new things each day and we're going to continue to adapt and make decisions that are science and data driven. It does seem to be like attacking all of the defenses we have. It, it uh, you know, it doesn't seem to respect uh, some kinds of masks, uh, plexiglass, uh, vaccines work. They don't work as well as we as they used to. Um, and, and in the legislature, you bring 188 people together. Yeah, they all will be masked up. You know, no one gets in there. So we, we were doing all those precautions. And right. we're taking it day by day based on what the health officials say. We may, you know, we're not going to be in there every day as a full 141 members. So, okay. And, you know, uh, the, I, I, one of the things I was going to bring up was the, the, uh, the fiscal situation for the state coming out of a recession. Really fortunate to have uh, a lot of money, multi billion dollar surplus. You brought up some important social needs uh, for people. What, what are your thoughts on? The, the best use of the surplus from last year and possible surplus for the new fiscal year? Well, with the influx of federal dollars and better than expected revenues, um, our budget gives us an opportunity to make some long needed investments. Uh, we're going to put this money and people to work by upgrading neglected state facilities, parks, bridges, schools, IT systems, and more. We're gonna focus on making critical upgrades rather than creating a new long-term spending priorities. Um, you know, there's a lot of good ideas that have been uh, floated uh, with these federal funds. Um, there still won't be enough to go around, but we will continue to work with the governor to protect our AAA um, bond rating while investing in projects that we think makes sense for our future. Well, you know, of course, it, it's an election year session, so yes. everybody's going to have ideas for the for the budget surplus, right? And it and it makes it 
maybe tougher for leadership to uh, figure out where, where the greatest needs are and, and what can be done. But we have certain areas that we're going to cover, and I'll try to do them briefly. We're going to be dealing with climate solutions, and that is something that the two chairs of the appropriate committee, Penske and Barve, are working to ensure, working together, ensure that we have a strong bill that addresses climate change, advances our clean energy level goals, protects and creates uh, union jobs, and makes Maryland a national leader in climate solution. Um, and there's been there has been several great ideas that came about, um, uh, like planting five million trees and transitioning to electric buses. But we're going to be looking at all of that this session. Um, another area is childcare. Uh, the pandemic shut down childcare uh, uh, providers across the state and is holding back our efforts to get more Marylanders back to work and help feed their families. We're looking at options um, to help child, child care providers uh, safely increase capacities and open new facilities. And we have two delegates still working on that, on this issue, and I'm confident that they'll come up with some great solutions. Um, following up the child care, uh, paid family leave. Too many Maryland are still home, still at home taking care of loved ones. Uh, family and medical leave insurance will allow more people, particularly more women, to get back to work and help feed their families. We're going to bring stakeholders together and work with employers and employees to see if we can create consensus. Um, the uh, another area that will be coming up will be the cannabis, as you had mentioned. This session, we're going to put a referendum for legalized cannabis on the 22 general election ballot. Polling shows that a majority of Marylanders support legal cannabis and we're going to put it on the ballot so voters can decide. The House it, formed the cannabis work group. On it. So, let me ask you a personal question on that sure. one. When, when uh, assuming that happens and it's, it's on the next ballot and you go to vote, personally, how, how will you vote on that issue, legalizing marijuana? Well, I, don't, I never like tell people how I vote because I want people to make their own decisions. So, uh, and you can take that the fact that I have wanted on the on the uh, on the ballot that is an important item that I want our citizens in Maryland to vote on. So. All right, let me let me ask about redistricting. It's one of the things that has to happen mm -hmm. uh, over the ninety day session. We're certain the governor will not be vetoing the legislative redistricting plan as he vetoed the congressional plan, because, of course, that's not how it works. Uh, the governor is required to submit a plan unless the legislature passes its own plan uh, within the first 45 days. The governor's takes effect, but the governor can't veto what the legislature does. And I'm guessing that you you intend to pass a plan. Yes, uh huh. probably within the first 45 days. Um, you know, the, the maps that have been redrawn, redrawn that, that adjust to the population group. Um, the, and so I, go ahead. Well, I was going to bring up the congressional map, uh, which the legislature passed over the governor's uh, objections. It's gotten some criticism for uh, gerrymandering from, you know, common cause, good government groups. Uh, it's going to be challenged in court. Do you think it holds up in court? The congressional map? Yes. Um, I can give you an answer on that. So uh, by the fact that it was going to court, I think the governor feels on that, but I think it was a map that I was on the committee, but um, I, I, I can't give you a solid answer on that, um, but yeah. Well, the last thing I wanted to bring up is that you're gonna have a lot of change. You have, um, there's always change in the legislature, but on a staff level, you have change, committee chairmanships, a, a lot of change. Do you, do you see that affecting the work of the session? No, because the people who are put in positions um, either with chairmanship or other areas because they're effective in what they do. So I think it's uh, you just the session will go along um, just as normal, um, you know, looking out for health issues. But other than that, the people that we have in place, I think they're, they're highly qualified to take over. 
Our thanks to the speaker. Now the beginning of this session will mark a major milestone for MPT, State Circle's 40th anniversary. Sue Copen has a look back at four decades of bringing the State House to your house. It all began January 8th, 1982. Good evening, I'm Ron Canada, and I'd like to welcome you to the first edition of State Circle. Over the course of the next 15 weeks, we intend to be your eyes and ears at the 1982 session of the Maryland General Assembly. Our reporters, Jeffrey Cole and Donna Martin and myself, will be keeping you up to date on what your state government is doing for or to you, as the case may be. And now, 40 years later, Ron Canada recalls that first show and MPT executive producer Everett Marshburn, who created it. I had uh, worked with Everett on a precursor show uh, which was uh, called a, a State House uh, Forum, which we did live from Annapolis, from the 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 uh, um, the Capitol building in the basement in a conference room, and then uh, I don't remember quite how, but between the, the uh, second season of uh, State House Forum uh, and January of '81, it morphed into State Circle. Canada, who has had a successful acting career in the decades following that first State Circle show, says there's a need to keep the public informed now more than ever. Because uh, unless we understand the way we govern ourselves and those people we choose uh, to take the responsibilities of government for us, um, if we don't understand what they're doing and why they're doing it, then we can lose those things very, very easily. Over the past four decades, there have been four anchors for State Circle, nearly two dozen reporters covering 40 regular sessions. There is no mention of any kind of a tax increase in this year's budget. Still to be answered is the question of what will happen with the gasoline tax or perhaps an increase in the sales tax to pay for transportation projects. We've reported on six governors, five speakers of the House, and four Senate presidents. That includes late Senate President Mike Miller and late House Speaker Mike Bush, who hold state house records for having served the longest in their positions. Miller, 33 years as president, Bush, 16 years as speaker. Now you have to remember that people have been here for 90 days working very hard. I mean, people on the outside uh, don't understand how much effort goes into uh, the legislative process down here. And it's pretty detailed and pretty intense uh, for a 90-day period of time. And they're in here 12, 14 hours a day, as you know, in committees on the floor of the House, particularly towards the end. So everybody's tired. They're a citizen legislature. They go back to their uh, jobs and their families, uh, and uh, they, need, they need a break. And the hardest part of all is they want somebody uh, who's enthusiastic all of the time. Uh, so that means that even though you're crying inside, You've got to, uh, to, to, to fake it so you can make it, and to, to coin the phrase. I mean, you have to really be enthusiastic, say there's going to be a better day tomorrow. When one door closes, another door is going to open. And that's, that's the toughest part of leadership, I think. Over the past four decades, the diversity of the 188-member legislature has evolved. In 1982, women made up just 15% of lawmakers. As of 2020, that number was up to 39%. In 1982, the legislature was 90% white, 10% black. In 2020, the number of African-American lawmakers increased to 29%, and that includes the first black and female Speaker of the House. Looking at the past history, you're, you're correct. There have been um, all white males, and I like to look at it as this new sheriff in town, and who happens to be an African-American um, woman and so it was two uh, historic firsts. Throughout the past 40 years we've brought you stories from Annapolis about some of the biggest challenges facing the state and that includes Maryland's savings and loan crisis in 1985 and the pandemic which changed operations at the State House starting in March of 2020. As we face a now global pandemic is more important than ever for us to balance fulfilling our constitutional duties and protecting the health of every single resident. When we face a common enemy, we all pull together 
and we take care of what needs to get done. And our common enemy is this health crisis. The Bay and environment have faced many challenges as well. In February of 1998, a state circle special tackled the Fisteria crisis. Good evening, everybody. It could have been the plot of a horror movie, but it happened last summer on the Lower Shore. Thousands of fish started turning up with ugly red bleeding lesions. Soon there were fish kills, and later humans developed rashes and other symptoms connected to something in the water. And there was the great stadium debate of 1996. Both of these stadium projects will be good for Maryland's economy and will create jobs. I am looking for your opposition on this project and I will actively campaign against you if you support the appropriations of this money. The Art Modell's contribution of $24 million is really just a drop in a bucket. It's like uh, trying to spray perfume on a, on a skunk. It may make it smell a little better, but it's still a rotten deal underneath. We've brought you battles from the floor over issues like welfare reform. That this is the last day of the session, and a lot of things get by us on the last day, and all I've asked for is a little time to look at it and examine the facts. This is a vote on a position that this House has already taken, ladies and gentlemen, and we want to amend it to satisfy the needs that you have been raising, and you want to delay it. I don't understand that. And there have been moments, Hi, like this Good one, from the 1991 yeah, State of the playlist. State. Clay Mitchell, Speaker of the House, we worked together in the past sessions, my friend, and I'm looking for his cooperation again this year, next year, for the following two years. Mike Knorr, Senate President, bright man, He's a firm believer of the separation of the executive and the legislative and the judicial branch. <laughs> I don't like it, but what the heck. <laughs> Forty years, thousands of pieces of legislation, issues ranging from gambling to school funding, to a statewide smoking ban, to police reform. Even the addition of 13 official state symbols and the elimination of one, the state song. And there's more yet to come as State Circle enters its fifth decade with the start of the 2022 General Assembly session. Stay tuned. Until then, I'm Ron Canada for State Circle, wishing you a good weekend. See you next week. And I'm Sue Copen reporting for State Circle. Sue, thank you, and thank you for joining us for State Circle. Have a good night. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities. Pre-apprenticeship programs are a way for us to reach out to people in the community and give them an opportunity to learn a trade. It develops skills for those workers, and it also provides skilled laborers for the contractor. The things that I learned through the pre-apprenticeship program is discipline, integrity, pride, and initiative. Going through the pre-apprenticeship program gave me an opportunity that I once went ahead. Today is for celebrating life. Laugh, scream, take chances. Because with a health plan through Maryland Health Connection, you can live without the what ifs. Just ask the nine out of 10 people who saved when they enrolled last year. For as little as $1 a month, you're covered for the doctor visits, mental health care, and so much more. This is health insurance you can live with. See how you can save with new discounts at MarylandHealthConnection.gov. Tonight on MPT. Next time on Midsummer Murders. Called to absorb the poison through his skin. A man is killed by his own company's cookie tin. Calder's Biscuits put this village on the map. Barnaby suspects the killer works at the factory. 